The simplex algorithm is one of the more complicated algorithms that we need to cover. The problem that we are going to work with in this example is a maximizing problem. In the algorithm instructions at the start of this video, I included some details on what to do if it is a minimizing problem. I will briefly cover an example of that at the end of this video. Also notice that in this particular problem, for each of the constraints, we have less than or equal to a particular value. If you have greater than or equal to some value, then you do need to use an alternative method. Those problems will be covered in a future video. In order to work with a maximizing problem, we do need to introduce some slack variables and form our objective equation. Here are our new equations, including slack variables. Notice that I have rearranged the original objective expression so that it is equal to zero, and I have introduced slack variables so that we have equals to the value rather than less than or equals to. The initial tableau thus looks like this. In our basic variable column, we have each of the slack variables mentioned, r, s, and t. I always include a row for p. We've then got columns for each of our standard variables, x, y, and z, each of our slack variables, r, s, and t, and we've got the value that we currently have for those expressions. I also include a column to the right where I'm naming each of those rows, r1, r2, r3, r4, are my row names, row 1, row 2, etc. I find it's very helpful to label them in this way, and I'm going to use capital letters to do it so that I don't get confused between the r that I've used as a slack variable. The values in each of the rows should be fairly evident where they are from. Our first constraint states that we have two x's, one y, no z's, and one r, so there are zeros appearing in z, s, and t for that particular row. For the objective row, make sure that you get those coefficients correct. There are minus three x's, minus four y's, and so on. Of course, we have no r, s's, and t's in there, and that has a final value of zero. Okay, moving on to our first tableau and actually working with this. Notice that I've now added a label to the column where I've named each of my rows. I've called it row operations. That will come into effect later on as we start doing things with the different rows. I've also added a column for the theta values. And a little reminder there that we're going to do the value divided by the pivot column value. I'll explain that when we get into it in a second. So the first thing that we do is identify the column that has the most negative value in the objective row. So looking along the objective row, we have negative 3, negative 4, negative 5 for x, y, and z. And so, of course, negative 5 is the most negative value. This is going to be our pivot column. That means that our pivot will be somewhere within this column. Next, we're going to calculate the values of theta. The way that we're going to do this is for each of the rows where we have basic variables, we are going to do the value divided by the value that's in the pivot column. In this case, we've got 10 divided by 0, which is obviously giving us an infinite value. We're going to do 20 divided by 1, and that's going to give us 20, and 30 divided by 2, and that's going to give us 15. We've now calculated the three values of theta that we need. We don't bother finding one for the objective row. Looking at these values of theta, we now look for the smallest positive value. In this case, it is 15. At the intersection of these two arrows, we've now identified our pivot. So 2 is going to be the pivot value in this particular case. We then proceed onto tableau 2. The first thing that we do when constructing this is we include z now as our basic variable. The reason for this is that the pivot is in the z column. It's in the row that was headed by t as the basic variable. And what we're doing is we're changing that value now, changing the t into a z, which will help us later on when we come to work out what the actual values are. This is quite commonly forgotten, so make sure that you do this. Then what we're going to do is we're going to divide the row headed by z by the value of the pivot. So here in the row operations, I'm calling this now row 7, We've got the original four. Obviously, we're going to have five, six, seven, and eight in this particular case. And we're going to do row seven is row three divided by two. I'm always going to write down that statement so that you can see what I'm doing. But when you're working through it yourself, I would also advise doing this. A lot of times in examples, what you'll see is that they will call them row one, two, three, four. And then when you do them again, they'll call them new row one, new row two, new row three, new row four. Personally, I find this to be quite confusing, so I will always call them the next set of numbers as we're coming up. Anyway, 
Row 7 is row 3 divided by 2, so what we simply do is we go through and we divide each of those values by 2. So 1 divided by 2 is a half, 0 divided by 2, 2 divided by 2, 0, 0, half, and 15. Now the whole point of this is that the entry that is our pivot should end up as a 1. Make sure that it does, otherwise of course it's all going to go wrong. We then work down the rest of the rows. So looking now at row 5, I'm going to say row 5 is row 1. Now what we're trying to achieve here is that we're trying to get the values in that Z column to be a 1 where the pivot was, but 0 everywhere else. And as we notice in Tableau 1, the value for the R row in the Z column is already 0. So that's absolutely fine. We don't need to do anything there. We've achieved what we needed to, to do. We've got a 0 in that place. So very simply, we can just copy that row back out again. However, when we come to the row that's headed with an S in Tableau 2, it isn't a 0. And so we've got to do something else. What we're going to do is we're going to take our original row 2 and through some combination of applying row 7, this newly changed pivot row, we're going to make sure that the value in the Z column becomes a 0. The way I'm going to do this is by doing row 6 being formed by row 2 minus row 7. If we look at that in detail, the value in Tableau 1 in the S row and the Z column is currently a 1. We're going to do that 1, take away our value for Z in the Z row, Z column, this value of 1. 1 take away 1 is obviously 0. But working along from left to right, we're going to do 0 minus a half is minus a half. 2 minus 0 is 2. 1 take away 1 is 0. Remember, that's the value that we were looking for. That's the one we were trying to achieve to get a 0, and that's what formed our row operation. We're going to do 0 take away 0, 1 take away 0, 0 take away a half, and 20 take away 15, and we've got our value of 5. We need to do the same kind of thing for our objective row in order to get a 0 in that column as well, in the Z column. So this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to do row 4 plus 5 lots of row 7. So the value in row 4 was a minus 5, and I'm going to add 5 lots of 1 so that I can get zeros everywhere in that Z column in Tableau 2. So working our way through that, we do minus 3 plus 5 lots of a half, minus 4 plus 5 lots of 0, minus 5 plus 5 lots of 1, that's giving us that zero, and now we've achieved exactly what we wanted in that particular column. In Tableau 2, in the Z column, we have a one where the pivot was, and zeros everywhere else. And we can then work our way through each of the others, and we get those values. And Tableau 2 is now complete. So we then follow the same procedures again with Tableau 2. First of all, we identify in the P row the value that is the most negative. In this case, it is the y with that minus 4. We then work out the values of theta, 10 over 1. That's the number in the value column divided by the number in the pivot column, 5 over 2 and 15 over 0. We look for the least positive value, which in this case gives us the s row, meaning that this is our pivot. We then draw our tableau again, noting that we have changed the s into a y. Again, that's going to help us later on. Don't forget to do that stage. Now we're going to divide our y row by the pivot value, and that gives us those values there. Now we need to work out our row operations. Again, we're trying to ensure that we keep our 1 in that y column and get zeros everywhere else. Row 9 is going to be formed by taking row 5 and subtracting row 10 from it. Whenever you're creating these row operations, I would always advise using the row that you are working on, then adding or subtracting a multiple of your pivot row. So R5 plus or minus some multiple of row 10. Always construct it in that way using the row that you're actually working with, R in this case. So we've got that row 5 and then some multiple of row 10. So that's what our values will be. For row 11, we're simply going to use row 7. When we get those values. We're going to do that row 12 is row 8 plus 4 times row 10. Again, we're trying to get a 0 in that bottom place there. So we've achieved what we needed to do. The Y column has a 1 where the pivot was and zeros everywhere else. And that's Tableau 3 complete.
we follow the same operations once more. The most negative value on the P row is of course negative 3 over 2 and our theta values 15 over 2 divided by 9 over 4 gives us 10 over 3, 5 over 2 divided by minus a quarter gives us minus 10, and 15 divided by 1 over 2. Remember that we're looking for the least positive value, in this case of course it's 10 over 3, and so that is our pivot. Create Tableau 4, again making sure that we're including the correct letter for the basic variable is, and now of course we need to make sure that we can get a 1 where the pivot was, so we're going to do row 13 is row 9 divided by 9 over 4. We're going to do our row operations on each of the others, so for the row headed with a Y, I'm going to do row 14 is row 10 plus a quarter of row 13. Gives us those values. Row 15 is row 11 minus a half of row 13, giving us those values. And for row 16, row 12 plus 3 over 2 times row 13. It's worth me saying at this point that I often find it's more helpful to use fractions in the simplex algorithm than decimals. Depends on your personal favorite, but often you can lose some data when you're working with decimals if you're just writing down a value corrected two or three decimal places, whereas a fraction is going to be a little bit more helpful. It does mean, though, sometimes your row operations look a little bit ugly or your calculations for the theta value, but just be careful. Take it easy, and I'm sure you'll get it right. Tableau 4 is now complete. And the first thing that we notice is that there are no negative values on the objective row. We've got three zeros, two thirds, five thirds, five thirds, and 90. There's no negative values, and actually this means that we can stop. Our first stage when we work with a new Tableau is to find the most negative value. There aren't any here. So we must be finished. Now all we need to do is to read off the values. All we need to do here is look down the basic variable column, read the variable, x, and read the value, 10 over 3. We've got the value that x must take in the optimized solution to the original problem. Remember that we change those values from r, s, and t in that basic variable column, and this is why. It's going to enable us to read them off. It's not always the case that they appear in alphabetical order in the first, second, and third rows. So you've got to make sure that you get the right ones in the right places. Y is then 10 over 3 as well, and Z is 40 over 3. So we've got those values. It will also give us the value for P. So P is 90. We look back at our original problem. This is what we were originally trying to solve. We can verify that these solutions work. If we take the original objective function, for p equals, substitute in the values of x, y, and z, we can see that we get 90, which is the same value as our simplex table gave us. So we know that it's worked. We can look at the constraints as well. For the first constraint, 2x plus y, we put those values in and we get the value of 10, which is certainly less than or equal to 10. For the second one, we get that it equals 20. This is certainly less than or equal to 20. And the third, we can see that we get 30. Again, less than or equal to 30. We can also check, are x, y, and z all greater than or equal to 0? Yes, they all are. That's absolutely fine. It's worth me saying at this point that in this case, each of the constraints gave the maximum possible value that was allowed under that constraint. So, for example, in constraint 1, we had to get less than or equal to 10, and we got 10. That's not always going to be the case. It happens to work in this particular example, in another example, you'll get some value which is less than or equal to. That's okay. As long as it works for the constraint, that is fine. It does not need to be the same as the value. Next, we're going to look at a minimizing problem. So here's an example of an objective function that we need to minimize. Minimize p equals minus 2x plus 3y. Now, as I said earlier, I'm only going to work with less than or equal to constraints in this case. Often, when you've got minimizing problems, you will have constraints that have greater than or equal to. That requires a slightly different method that I will cover in another video. However, our process here is relatively straightforward. First of all, we're going to redefine the objective function. We're going to use another letter. I'm going to use Q, and I'm going to say that Q is the negative of P. This, of course, gives us that Q is the negative of minus 2x plus 3y, the negative of that P, which gives us that Q is 2x minus 3y, and of course, we need to restate it as q minus 2x plus 3 equals 0. Remember when we were 
stating our original problem in the maximizing, we needed to create our objective function being equal to zero. So an initial tableau here would look something like this. I've got those rows for R and S. They're simply the slack variables that I have used in those two main constraints. And I've put the various coefficients for Q in as well. I haven't included the other rows that I might use to actually work with it. This is just to show you the initial tableau. After working through this problem, you would end up with a final tableau looking something like this one. And to read the values off, we would do the same process as before. We would say X is 16 and over seven. That's nice and straightforward. But we notice here that we've got R. We don't have Y in this particular case. That's absolutely fine. There's no problem there. This is the final tableau. We have no negative values on the bottom. We're not going to keep going and try and turn y into some value. All this is telling us is that y takes the value zero. It doesn't have any other value. It's not equal to 120 over seven or anything like that. Effectively, what we're stating is that r would have to take the value 120 over seven in order to get the maximum out of that constraint. We don't need to worry about that though because the original problem is stated in terms of x and y. We have x and y being greater than or equal to zero. So it's absolutely fine. We can also read that Q is equal to 32 over seven. And this is where it really helps to have a different letter defining your objective function. So Q is 32 over seven, but we remember that Q was the negative of P. So this tells us that P is equal to negative 32 over seven. That is the minimum value that we can take in this particular case. So the simplex algorithm is a relatively complicated algorithm. You need to be very careful when working with these types of problems. The main area that people struggle with when they're doing this is in those row operations. Be very careful when you're doing them. Again, I would advise that you label each new row with the next number rather than just sticking to row one to four and new row one to four and then new, new row one to four, but label them five, six, seven, eight, and so on. I would also suggest to make sure that when you're doing those row operations, you do follow the same format each time. Take the row that you are adjusting and add or subtract a multiple of the pivot row. There are plenty of places to make mistakes, so be very careful with any arithmetic that you're doing. Using a calculator is absolutely fine. Just make sure that you get it right, because unfortunately, when you make one minor mistake in the simplex algorithm, it can lead to big problems later on. However, take the whole thing slowly and carefully and good luck for it. Mm -hmm.